Hello, thank you for joining me today. I'm going to do a video talking about which colours I use so that I can link that at the bottom of every video because a few people have asked what colours I use and I wanted to also explain about colour charts which I think is the most valuable exercise you can do to learn about colours and how they interact with each other and it helps you choose what colour to use when you want to paint a certain thing and it really shows you the potential of everything you can do with all the colours when they interact with each other. So I'll talk more about that as I show you them. I've done a chart for each colour here. These are my pure colours that I use in my palette. And basically what watercolour charts are, is taking a pure colour and mixing it to different degrees with all the other colours. So I'll start with cadmium, cadmium yellow. And I'll have these charts available on my website, a link below. So you can download them and print them for your own reference. This is cadmium yellow and this is the, that's how I painted it and then I tied it up on the computer. You can see the unified effect of mixing a bit of one colour with the rest of them and the different varieties you can get. So, for example, ultramarine and cobalt blue, they look completely different from their original colours, but some are quite similar, like the yellow ochre, but it just shows you the potential because brands sell hundreds of different colours and a lot of them aren't necessary because, as you'll see, you can mix a lot of them using their own basic pigments that they sell. For cadmium yellow, I mix two different colours. Cotman's Windsor New Newton Cadmium Yellow Hue and Hansa Yellow Medium by Daniel Smith. Put those two there. These pigments I mix by personal choice because I find this uh, cadmium yellow hue is too warm, too orange, and this one is too acidic, too bright, too vivid, and I like somewhere in between. But it's not important, so my own perf personal preference. Cotman is the cheapest kind of watercolour you can get. Daniel Smith is probably on the more expensive range. You can use any brand, just the main cadmium yellow still works. It's still very much similar. It's just I like that slight variation. Moving on to yellow ochre. Quite similar to cadmium yellow, although much more muted, as you can see. A more earthy tone to it. Now, with the watercolour charts, you try and move or have a different uh, gradation with the consistency or the dilution of the pigment. So you start off very thick and move lighter so that you can see how it might be affected when you actually um, get more diluted. And as you can see also, I split each square into two different um, strengths of the pigment. So on the bottom half, I'm more emphasized on the yellow ochre, on the top top fifth or quarter, it's more cadmium yellow for that particular example. And for yellow ochre, I 
I generally mix them up. I, I, I use Cotman again, Daniel Smith's Yellow Ochre and Winsor Newton. And it just really is not that important which, whichever I feel like at the time. They're all a bit different, but not so different with this particular pigment. It's just, it's not like um, it's going to be obvious in the final piece with that, with that specific colour, yellow ochre. Other ones we get to later, like Lizard and Crimson, better quality does show quite, quite um, obviously. Next is Drawn 1. I include this here because it's in my palette, but I don't usually use this as a wash. It's a very thick pigment, very opaque. It's more like gouache than watercolour. But I'll include it there anyway. And it's very similar to white, except it has a yellow hue to it. It's basically yellow ochre mixed with white. And I use it for highlights or warm smoke effects. Next is a burnt sienna. Now with burnt sienna, the main paint that I use is quite difficult to pronounce. In fact, I don't think I've ever had to pronounce it out loud before. Quin, quinacridrone, quinacridrone burnt orange. So it's not actually called burnt sienna, but I very much like it. It's, um, it's, got, it's very nice and rich when you use it thickly with a high consistency it's very dark it can almost be black and as you can see when you mix it with ultramarine it basically is um, black or gray or neutral um, and then as it gets lighter then the color is very is very thin and can go very smoothly but you could also use transparent oxide red by Daniel Smith or Windsor Newton. With these more transparent pigments, I think better quality brands or tubes are a better option. Because if you use Cotman for that one, it's not authentic and it'll have this, it won't be so rich and it'll be quite obvious. But as for beginners or learners, you can definitely use Cotman's. Um, that's what I did until I was comfortable enough to use a bit more expensive materials. Next is Cadmium Red. I'm going through the colours obviously in the order that they are here on the chart. So obviously, with each colour, they're going to be unified with the colour that is predominating. So most of them are going to be red, but you can just see mixing them with the others just creates a different tone of red, one that you might normally buy in a tube rather than actually mix yourself. But having done this and going through it, you can see what options you have of what you've already got. And by doing these charts, also you learn how powerful some pigments are compared to others. For, for, for example, Burnt Sienna, the last colour, it's very powerful. You don't need a lot of that to go a long way. But something like Cerulean Blue or Cadmium Yellow, it, it needs much more of it in order to cover t its ground, like 
if you just went half and half with the pigment, it would predominate with the burnt sienna rather than the cadmium yellow. So you have to put less of the cadmium, yeah, you have to put less of the burnt sienna in in order to make it equal. And these are the kind of things you learn when you do this exercise. Alizarin crimson. Now, alizarin crimson on these charts look quite similar. They're both obviously red. Alizarin crimson is a bit of a cooler red. Cadmium red is warmer. But also a big difference is that cadmium red is more opaque and alizarin crimson has, well, it's translucent, so it, it when it gets thick, it gets very dark again. And so with these dark pigments that you mix together to create very dark, almost black, I mean, separating all the other colours, that could be seen as a very dark, that, that, that looks black, pure black, until it's diluted. to mention the colours that I used for those particular ones so for my cadmium red I use Cotman or organic vermilion again this is the more expensive version this is the cheaper version um, I guess ultimately well the more expensive one is better but not a huge amount better so it's not going to make much difference while you're learning to use the cheaper one and then with alizarin crimson it is quite important to get the expensive brand because it um, it needs that deep deep kind of translucence that doesn't really exist in the cheaper ones. So I use permanent alizarin crimson and Windsor and Newton's alizarin crimson there. Next is lavender. This is another thick, opaque one, a bit like gouache. This is Holbein. I haven't actually tested any of the other brands with this colour. I'm happy with that, so I was willing to stick with that. And I'm constantly testing the other colours and working through the brands. It's not specific to the brand, you can, it's just the names, the colour labels that um, I, I'm talking about here. So lavender can be nice just to, I like that harmony, I just like the the way it all looks cool and um, I like the colours in that one so sometimes I just look at these charts and it inspires me to paint a certain tone or colour scheme because I can, I can look at these colours and think, ah, I want to use that somewhere. What scene can I paint in order to use that? And then I can find something that inspires me that way. Next is purple. Now this, the pigment that I use for this is quite weird, I mix my own. I don't have the actual tubes at the moment, but it's a mix of Winsor Newton Mauve and Daniel Smith's Cobalt Violet Deep. And I mix that and just put it in the pot. I don't use it that often, so this has lasted me a long time. 
it's not very it's not a very natural looking colour. Um, so I don't use it for large areas. I only hint at it in certain areas, and that's why it lasts so long. But even still, I love the different colours you can get with this, and just by having that single colour there and mixing it with the rest, there's so many different variations you can get that you may not have thought about before. Even going on to some very different colours there. Ultramarine blue. Just a single um, Daniel Smith. Again, this is one of the ones that I wouldn't necessarily use the um, cheaper brands for this one. Once you're comfortable, of course, when you're beginning, you can use whatever you like. Yeah. I found when I was learning, I was more comfortable using cheaper mediums and using a lot, not being scared to use a lot than using expensive ones and being very timid and being too weak with my paints. So once you're comfortable, a bit more comfortable or can afford to use more expensive ones, then uh, move as soon as you can, as soon as you feel comfortable. So ultramarine and cobalt look quite similar again. But cobalt has um, is very thick and opaque and ultramarine is translucent and that basically means when you load it on quite thick and thick consistency again it goes very dark but when you do it with cobalt blue Although it's still dark, it's not black. It's still focus. It's still obviously a a, a colour rather than just black. Cerulean blue, one of my favourite pigments. This one is quite specific. This one is um, Daniel Smith Cerulean Blue. I specifically like this one because it's the pigments are very are very thick, but they're not. They create a lot of texture. If you can see here, they create a lot of cool effects. Which is really nice, especially on that. Alizarin Crimson. So again, once you have these charts, you can just pick them out, flick through them, and decide which colour to use. And let's say you see a patch of grass, or a tree, or a building, or a window, or a car, and you think, well, how do I mix that colour? You can just look at your charts and be like, oh, it's that colour at that dilution. It's cerulean blue mixed with yellow ochre at about 30% dilution. It's a much easier way to think about colour. And if you do these charts yourself, you'll kind of automatically know those colours by intuition because you'd already done it before. It kind of sinks in. You won't have to rely on the charts as much You'll still have them there for reference anyway, or inspiration. Viridian. I use Daniel Smith again. Viridian, although again, it's not that important. I quite like this one again, because it has a pigment that just creates very nice textures. Especially when mixed with purple. For some reason, I just like that effect. I don't know the science behind it, to be honest. I think 
the weight of the pigments or the density of them, as they dry, they're on different layers and it kind of creates this atmospheric depth within the paint when you mix them. And this is another good, good, good reason to do these colour charts, not specifically for the colours themselves, but to see how the pigments interact with each other and which pigments look better together, which you wouldn't otherwise know if you hadn't put them all out on paper. Here's black. I call it black because that's just an easy term for it, but I actually use neutral tint because sometimes black can be too warm uh, with a lot of brands, but neutral tint is a pure black. And um, you can see this with this one specifically. How many other colours brands sell as individual pigments like Payne's Grey looks a lot like the cerulean mixture of black. And of course these ones are quite hi highly um, exaggerated because I'm actually trying to show the other colour. But if you put less emphasis on those colours and just hinted at those colours then it would look you could just get different tones of black rather than just a solid black. You can make blacks more interesting. So yeah, I'll use neutral tint. Or actually If you want to go for the cheap version, lamp black, it's not as good as the neutral tints, but it's the closest option for a budget. Next is white. And with white, I use um, gouache rather than watercolor. Is this a complete white um, pigment that's water soluble and I don't use these as washes I use these as highlights to put on like a, the, uh, a little highlight on the top of a car or a boat or a figure I don't use it much but if you wanted to um, and I really I don't actually mix white with any other color when I'm painting but if you felt like you wanted your highlight to have a little bit of an extra colour, then um, this could be useful to see. Now, if you want to do these yourself, um, there's a quicker way, instead of doing it so um, technical, as in um, mixing them all, them all up individually, from light to dark, cutting them and then mixing with mixing them with the opposite. For example, if I if I take let's see if I take this viridian and purple. In order to get these, I cut the top half or fifth, fifth off and swap them around so that I can see their opposites. So on this one, of course, the viridian is predominating and on this one, the purple is predominating. And then you can use your mind to, on, on the charts, I blurred the edge so that you can see the gradation a bit better. But if you didn't want to go through all that, um, of, co well, of course you can print out these charts anyway on the website that I've linked below. But if you wanted to do them yourself, there's a quicker way you could just 
do tiny squares, not worrying about the dilution, just doing a quick little mix. So with these pigments, these aren't in my palette, but I use them every now and again. I've got cobalt teal blue. A nice turquoisey colour. Which I don't use often enough to be in my main palette. And it's too artificial for like natural um, objects. I'd only paint them for man made objects, and usually that means squirting it onto my palette rather than ha having it completely there permanently. Then iridescent blue silver. I bought that as an experiment. Um, it's a weird one. It's difficult to see close up, but it kind of has this kind of shy, silvery kind of granulated effect. It's it's nice for when you see a painting in real life, but it doesn't because of the effect of the the shine, the glimmer, um, it doesn't work when looking at, it at a, a painting digitally or a print of it. Coral orange, I use this in, in a lot of paintings, but only as highlights direct from the tube, like um, a car light or a traffic light. But I still wanted to see what they look like, just because it's useful to see how far your pigments can go. New Gambonge. I bought this one by accident. I think it's a fairly common mistake. You see a colour on a tube and you think, oh, that's close to the colour I want. But then when you open it, you discover, well, I don't need to open it, you can see it's actually a very dark pigment. It's only that light colour when it's diluted quite a lot. And that wasn't very useful to me. Um, because it's difficult to control, but it's still interesting to see what potential it has, so I made a few swatches of it. So all those are all the colours that I used. There's another couple of charts I want to quickly show you, because they're useful exercises to do, because of course watercolour has many different effects depending on the thickness or consistency of the pigment and how wet the paper is when you apply that pigment. So I did a chart using blue um, just to demonstrate all the different effects and this is a useful one to do yourself. It's very difficult to do and takes quite a bit of time but it trains you to get every single to know how to get every single effect or technique possible. So starting here, that's the thickest pigment you can get and applying it on a completely dry background with no other colour on. And as you move down here, this direction, the wetter the paper is, so at the end there it would be very sodden. And then the next square along is the pigment a bit more diluted until you get here, where it's very diluted, and you can see when you add a diluted uh, brush stroke on an already wet paper, it, it flattens out much different to how it would do if it's a very thick pigment. Then each step further is more pigment on the paper to begin with, ending here like a very solid wash it's hardly visible actually, unless you look at it right up front. But it can show you where things can go wrong, mainly there. If you have, if you have a pigment, a, a wash about medium tone, and you add a white, uh, a highly, a highly diluted brush stroke onto a pigment that is more consistent, then it will cauliflower like that. 
So to avoid mistakes like that, you always have to add more pigment than the wash underneath. And I did the same thing with uh, the white gouache. Because um, sometimes you want to get nice smoky effects um, to add more atmosphere. So you need to know where the range is. And this one's quite difficult because white gouache always looks lighter when it's wet than when it's dry. So when these ones here were wet, they looked exactly the same as here, but when they dry, they just darken out completely. So I hope this video was useful. It was a bit of a new experiment. I mean, I've never had to talk this much. Usually I, I paint when I'm talking rather than talking directly about theory. Um, I thought it would be useful anyway. I hope you've got something for it, from it. As I said, I can link the video, um, the watercolour charts you can find on my website to... Um, download or print or just save them on your phone or iPad as reference. Because these are really useful to, to see even for your yourself. Um, and of course these are the colours that I use. You may already have chosen your own palette that you like to use. Um, and your charts will be different to mine. But thank you very much. Um, I hope this has been helpful and um, see you next time.